So thank you, Professor, for this uh, inspiring talk. We now will continue the discussion with the panel dis uh, discussion. Do you want to say anything? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I would like to, I like to ask uh, Jorge Figueira and the Industry Liaison Officer of University of Coimbra that will lead the discussion for uh, the next minutes. And um, I will invite also the panelists, uh, Diana Fernandes, that has been working intensively with the E3 Forum, the initiative from the MIT Portugal students and students from other faculty. So Diana, if you want to join us here. Uh, Gonzalo Mourinho, that is the director of the MIT Portugal Innovation and the Partnership Initiative of the, and also the Building Global Innovators. <coughs> Uh, João Nuno Moreira of University of Coimbra and also entrepreneur himself, uh, being a co-founder of the Tree Two. Uh, José Costa, uh, also an entrepreneur from University of Coimbra, from the uh, WSPP. Uh, we also had the pleasure to host uh, Joseph Shaman, that uh, has been working as an independent uh, board advisor for the MIT Portugal Program in Innovation and Entrepreneurship Initiative. And also, finally, uh, Teresa Mendes, from the, the president of the EPN Institute, Pedro Nunes, also here in Coimbra. So I'd like to pass the word to Professor Deva. Do you want to say something? <laughs> Just to, again, to, to thank uh, Professor Cooney for his, his wisdom. Um, my my uh, takeaways is that welcome the, the panel. We definitely want to open it up for uh, discussion and questions as, as well. I think the really important points that uh, Charlie mentions about uh, convergence of technologies, choosing the best technology, the specificity, the, the leadership and continuous learning, and uh, the open innovation model from Vasco de Gama to our example of Desponde Center and to MIT Portugal that is not new, but what a great presentation and conciseness in terms of recommendations. And um, are we all willing to take the risk and, and manage it? So again, to, just to thank uh, Charlie and welcome the, the panel. We look forward to a stimulating discussion. Okay, good morning to you, you all. Um, Thank you very much for, for being here, and uh, uh, let's uh, and and thank you very much uh, for uh, uh, Charles' presentation. I, I guess it's a good frame for 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 us to to speak about uh, um, the collaboration between uh, uh, university and industry and towards uh, entrepreneurship. So there is a large pi panel, and uh, it's uh, I think it's uh, hopefully the, the first panel. Uh, uh, after uh, the last soccer game yesterday, uh, that will not speak about football today. So uh, you feel free to do it. So my panelists and congratulations to our fellow Amer Americans here for, for the, 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 the score and the results. Um, uh, and passing go to the, the next phase of, of the, 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 the World Cup. Uh, but we are we have many and very good panelists. Uh, my colleague already presented them, so we'll try to go just right to for for the, the a, a short presentation of its of each uh, participant, uh, each panelist here. Um, I will ask. I already ask each one of them to uh, try to manage uh, their fifth, five minutes time to do. Uh, uh, starting a presentation about themselves, their initiatives, and of course their views on, on uh, collaboration in the, of university industry uh, towards entrepreneurship and, and how the role of uh, MIT uh, uh, Portugal program in, in, in this process. I, I will start right away with um, uh, the first uh, uh, talk, the first presentation of, of Diana Fernandes from E3 Forum. And I'll give, I'll pass the word to her. Um, good morning. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, first of all, I would like to explain in an easy way what E3 stands for. It's E3 for Education, Employment, and Entrepreneurship. Um, the whole idea, basically, is to actually promote cooperation between entrepreneurs, the industry, academia, and policymakers. It's not about 
uh, having just one side of the question, but having everyone at the same place and arguing about how they can move forward, how they can cooperate. And luckily, I hope in the last four years we have been able to have this kind of discussions. Last one was in May. And we have debates between different uh, people and, ba and backgrounds. Uh, we also have uh, posters competitions because it's a nice way, for instance, for people present their work to not just academia but the, out the outside, for instance, like business people to know what is happening inside acad academia. And also it's about uh, sharing knowledge. Um, so the basic ideas about these three is pretty much sharing and, and cooperation. It's the two main ideas that we have. On the last uh, four years, what we have been learning, and is how we see it, academia is a great, um, it's a great, it's a great um, way that we, it's a great place where we can find three, three different things. I, it's an idea source, talent source, and research space. So when uh, the outside looks the academic, they look, the, uh, they have the knowledge, the people, most of all the people, and the question is, how can we translate that back to society? Uh, the, uh, usually, there are two main issues that we address a couple of times, is how we transfer technology and how do we promote the cooperation between not just industry, but with the uh, societies as well. And the key issue uh, that we have tried to explore a couple of times is how can we align different incentives from academia and industry uh, that could work both ways. So, if, so pretty much E3 is kind of putting all uh, people from different places and, uh, on the same room, um, trying them to speak on an informal manner so this kind of cooperation can flow easily and not just by conference. And hopefully uh, people will start somehow to trust, trust each other and also to be able to cooperate even if they have different mindsets as was clearly explained, academia and the industry. So, this is what we have been trying to do. Uh, so it's kind of the short presentation that I have. Okay. So I hope. Yeah. Thank you very much, Diana, for, for your uh, views on, on uh, matter. So I will give the word to Gonzalo Amorin, the director of MIT Portugal Innovation and Entrepreneurship, and uh, well-known uh, person on building global innovators. We have several uh, venues here of global uh, building global innovators, and I will speak to. That's the word to So thank you very much, George, for the invitation. Thank you, all the panelists. Uh, thank you, Charles, for being here with us today and sharing this great, uh, this great uh, uh, experience and uh, journey uh, that uh, is uh, it's very exciting for us to also engage in uh, in such a journey in Portugal. So I will probably focus my uh, three or four minutes in giving you a, an overview of how we started and as, uh, as uh, uh, in the innovation entrepreneurship area, uh, a small spillover effect of the MIT Portugal program uh, has, has started to, to do some, have some impact on commercialization of knowledge and science in Portugal. So I've been in the program for the last five years, close to five years, and uh, uh, what, what we were asked to do was think about um, something that Charlie mentioned in his presentation, bridging the gap between knowledge, research, uh, applied knowledge, and then uh, transferring uh, what we call transitional knowledge into society and have some impact and hopefully sustainable impact that can then drive more investment into universities. And that's, that's, uh, that's the idea. So the first thing I would say is that uh, the importance of programs that uh, like MIT Portugal and others, uh, when we look back five, six, seven years ago, uh, the reality today, and I think uh, everyone, all investigators, uh, all uh, policy makers will, will agree, is that something's changing in Portugal, and uh, something's changing for the better. Although uh, we lost the football cup, um, <laughs> there are good things happening, and uh, I'm very excited about the uh, next uh, few years because I, I'm starting to see not uh, just the summit, Charlie, but uh, the way down, uh, which, uh, which is, uh, you know, just keeping the, the momentum of the whole process going. So the importance of uh, 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 such programs uh, such as MIT Portugal aligned to streamline 
the researchers, the policy makers, the use of the limited funds that Portugal's small country has, and um, that, that efficiency use of capital is very important for us. Um, and as we know, we've been ignoring largely uh, for the previous decades some of the, uh, uh, the issues that uh, concern uh, the market issues, commercialization issues, innovation issues, and we now know what we didn't know then, which is a, a critical part of the process. So we now can establish goals and then think about execution. So uh, the second thing is that uh, we now have uh, vibrant students, and Diana is doing a great job on that with E3 Forum. E3 is led by students, which is great, because uh, then researchers and uh, professors and uh, people like myself have got the time just to focus on the talent and, uh, and focus on, on, on helping building the, 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 or, or bridging the gap with the market, which is what we're trying to do. And that's really important because uh, the students are taking over, uh, they're feeling the ownership of the process, but most importantly, they feel they have a future and they can uh, build companies if they want, if that's the case, and they have good universities, good science, good foundations to do research if that's their, their goal. Uh, third aspect I'll focus on is when we started out and uh, uh, the first discussions that we all at MIT and we were discussing with Charlie and many other members at the faculty is that these things take a lot of time to happen. You know, we wanted things for tomorrow. We wanted something with impact for the next year. And uh, the first thing that Charlie told us, me and Jose Paul sitting there, was that, guys, if you have something to show after maybe six to eight years, you're very lucky. <laughs> so so we, we've been in the process for the last five years, and um, we're very happy because where, where, we, where we did the, the, the shortest uh, standard deviation, which is great. So uh, now the role is to scale it up and the challenge is to um, keep the momentum and uh, really speed up so that uh, we have a smooth descent and that the system is, is sustainable. Um, the other aspect that we, for us was very challenging is that um, when you think about MIT and taking the best practices we have to think about how we can apply those practices to Portugal, which is in a different uh, speed and different state, and what we can take, adopt, adapt. And uh, that was a, a, a very uh, interesting challenge. And I would say uh, today we know what we are doing. At least we think we know it, what we are doing, which is great. So we have a map, which we think is right, but it's changing every year. And that's uh, challenging the, the BGI team every year and uh, challenging also our colleagues at MIT. And one thing I should uh, uh, praise is uh, uh, Charlie's always given us the scope to experiment. And that's, that's probably the most important thing is keeping improved the map, keep looking at uh, what you're doing well and what, what you need to improve. And that's, that's really part of the process, experimentation. And have someone that helps you guide through the process because you'll fall and you'll have to uh, obviously stand up again and uh, keep the focus in mind and execute. So team, team is very important, team members, building up a team when you have very lack of resources, you're, you're bootstrapped uh, and you have to motivate others with a common shared goal and nobody's sure of the end result. The only thing you can, you can really do is believe and, and make sure that uh, everyone's aligned with the shared belief to execute that, that goal. And that has been our mission with BGI, with universities, sharing with researchers, trying to persuade them that uh, it's useful uh, to be one of those 67% statistics, a full professor, why should you care? Why should you bother? You're the ones who must be the role models for others to follow. So there's lots of uh, barriers and lots of uh, difficulties that we, we are trying to overcome every year within a uh, bootstrapped ecosystem as a whole. Everyone knows the dire situation Portugal is in, but I sense and I feel and I share with many others, and I'm not the only one uh, that see the end of, at the end of the tunnel. And with that, maybe my time is over. So I'll just sum up um, with some numbers which are timid, but are growing by the day. So, Building global innovators now, it's uh, a 
brand that is a spillover effect from MIT Portugal and many other international programs, Carnegie Mellon, uh, Fraunhofer, Harvard, and many other parts, Austin, and obviously the effort of all the Portuguese community, the ecosystem is adapting, is changing um, uh, permanently. It's, it's in, in, in constant mutations. It's hard today to have a snapshot of the, of the situation. So the map is changing, being iterated every day, every month, which is a good thing, because it's improving uh, in, in the good sense. And that's lots of experimentation. Portugal starting to look at the world and starting to look at, again, uh, global ambitions. And uh, some of the numbers I wanted to, to sum up my, my, my conclusion and, and my uh, notes is we have uh, a number of startups that are active in them at the moment, 55 spin-outs and startups. Uh, some of them are uh, university-based uh, that have raised about uh, 23 million euros and uh, some of whom are, are now moving into Series B financing with international venture capitalists and looking at international uh, global ambitions, which is a very good thing indeed. And uh, investors are starting to look at Portugal, which is even much better, a small country that really can excel and uh, deserves uh, a much better place in, in the ecosystem, global ecosystem, and we'll get there. And we also have been creating some jobs uh, close to 200 jobs, so things are happening and we're very optimistic about the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gonzalo, <laughs> for your introduction. I will go just to João Paulo, Professor João, Paulo, João Moreira. He's a professor from our uh, pharmacy faculty and also co-founder of Treat You. Uh, Treat You was one case um, I was listening to Charles, and, uh, 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 Professor Charles, and I was reminding me of when we started our ecosystem year at, at Coimbra in 2008, and we formed the ecosystem. We had all the infrastructures, all the pieces of the puzzle, but we, we didn't have the ensemble, as the orchestras say. So we started to build a common strategy with all the players here at, at, at the region, center region, of Coimbra region, and we just studied ecosystems around the world. So we studied MIT ecosystem, of course, Berkeley, Singapore, Sophie Antipolis in, in, in France, out of France, and uh, some uh, Campinas in Brazil. We, we studied 13 ecosystems and we pick up, as Gonzalo said, best practices from those uh, ecosystems and try to adapt to our reality. And one uh, practice that we adapt from Das Funder Center was the ignition funds. So, uh, and we, uh, every year here at Quimbra, we had um, ig ignition grants for uh, researchers to, to, to um, uh, study the commercial impact of their research. Um, and the, the, this year we will give 10 ignition grants and uh, 85 projects applied. So that's very, 89 projects applied. So that's very good. Um, John Nun Moreira and, and Treat You and uh, his work he was one of the first ignition grants that was granted. We, you had two, I, I guess, two, two for different projects. Yes, so I, I'll ask uh, shortly to. You should apply for another one. You should apply for the proof of concept one now. Um, uh, so I asked Joan Nunmore what is his experience of this particular case of ignition funds, and of course to, to, to his presentation about the, 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 the theme of the, the panel, of course. Portugal program uh, through the advanced course on drug development along my colleagues uh, Luis Almeida, uh, Serge Simões and Stan Fickenstein and also through the ITEMS project along with colleagues from the University of Minho, uh, IST and uh, Universidade Nova. Uh, and this uh, ITEMS uh, project, um, I think all, all of you are aware of the goal of this uh, educational project. Basically, the students are assigned with a technology uh, developed uh, in a Portuguese university. And in, in, in simple terms, they have to establish a path for uh, market translation. So it's really a hands-on training project um, during one semester. So it's, 
you know, I'll say a fairly, uh, a fairly uh, original and uh, disruptive way of teaching. Um, and as, as has been said here uh, this morning uh, ver uh, several times, the main goal is to <coughs> make uh, uh, or bridge this gap between academic research and economic value. And I think this was really a problem we have, uh, we had in our universities before um, uh, programs as the uh, MIT Portugal uh, program uh, has come uh, into to the country. And so, to each technology, it's really important that each technology is supported by solid science. But you know, to make this translation, as uh, Professor Cunha has uh, mentioned, you know, there are many other issues that have to be addressed, such as the IP, whether or not the technology has an IP associated, and if not, whether there's room for, for, to generate novel IP, what will be the licensing uh, model of that technology. They have also to assess the maturity level of the, the technology they have enhanced. It's important also, as already been mentioned here, whether that technology is really addressing a specific problem of, for example, a company or a, a specific problem and a specific need of the society. And also it's important to assess uh, what's the uh, market value of technology. And this, this activity, this uh, educational activity, you know, I would say that it has been very successful. Um, you know, it, it has you know, uh, spread, the, I'd, I'll say, a seed in the country on a novel form uh, of looking at research results and v uh, value research results. Um, there have been many, many projects that uh, have been already assessed through this uh, um, educational pro uh, project. I emphasize, for example, Silico Life is a company um, based in Minho and Cell2B. So these are examples of two companies there have gone through this assessment and are operating in Portugal. <laughs> and ourselves in my group, so we, we, we tried to, um, you know, um, we've gone since 2008 uh, through also through a process of trying to uh, value uh, a technology that has been um, developed in my group using this, uh, I mean, applying these uh, principles that are associated with uh, these activities such as the um, uh, iTeams project. So we had a nanoparticle for drug delivery um, and we, we've uh, filed the patent in 2008. Um, the, we had to, to, to wait four years to have actually the patent uh, granted. It was really a very difficult pro, uh, process. Since the very beginning, we had uh, a strong support from our tech transfer office, which, by the way, is led by Jorge Figueira. Um, and so he knows how difficult this was. Uh, and at a certain point, we, although, uh, we also had the help and the support of the health cluster portion. So they were also really important in this um, uh, filing of this first patent. So, I mean, this had a nice, uh, a nice end. Associated with this technology, we have <coughs> two additional uh, patents that have been already granted, one in 2012 and the last one actually in the beginning of this month. And since the very uh, be beginning of this project, we've, we've been in close collaboration with physicians from the Portuguese Institute of Oncology, not only to uh, you know, help us out with the data interpretation, but they were also really important in order to validate the fact that we had a technology th that was truly addressing a, a problem and the need for, of the oncological patients. Uh, in 2012, we've uh, you know, published the, the paper, um, so we validate, validated the science among our peers, and so this technology has been uh, licensed to a spin-off that in the meantime, myself, Sergio Simões, and Vera Moura, Vera, uh, she, she was the student that actually developed the technology. So the, the, the technology was um, licensed to, uh, to treat you, which is a spin-off from the University of Coimbra and the Center for Neuroscience and Cell Biology. And so the company now owns a technology or is exploiting a technology that is protected. The in vivo proof of concept has been, uh, is concluded. So the technology is ready for industrial manufacturing uh, it addresses uh, an unmet medical need for a global market. And these were 
the features that, in my opinion, were crucial to you know, gather the attention of the private sector. So we have now investment from Blue Pharma, which is a FDA-approved pharmaceutical company based here in Coimbra. Um, although Blue Pharma, they have, I mean, they've been with us even before any of these patents actually had been granted. We have at the moment also two um, uh, grant projects ongoing, so funding from EU and uh, the Ministry of Economy. And more recently, last year, August last year, we had uh, Portugal Ventures as also a shareholder of, of the company. Uh, so uh, the national um, uh, venture capital uh, company. So uh, in my perspective, uh, the MIT Portugal program, um, and especially uh, its um, education component or its, its uh, educational platform, is a, a crucial uh, uh, player, a crucial element of an ecosystem that, in my opinion, is already being put, put uh, is becoming in place in Portugal, that involves many other players, like the research we, we actually perform in our universities that is of high quality, the TTOs, the tech parks, the industry, the health clusters, and you know, we are starting having, having some money from VCs, and I believe that this, this ecosystem will be crucial to actually add economic value to the technologies we, we generate, and ultimately, ultimately, my hope is that you know, in the future, in the mid-long term, we'll have you know, a solid um, knowledge-based model of economical uh, development. This is it. Thank you very much, Ron, for your presentation. Now I'll hand to Jean, uh, Professor José Costa from uh, the Mechanical Department, uh, Engineering Department for, of the University of, of Coimbra and also co-founder of WSBP. Uh, that will present uh, it, it, its company and also it's a well-known uh, also researcher for collaborative uh, works with, with industry and uh, we, we start speaking a lot uh, about of, uh, collaboration from the university to, to companies but also Professor Jacques Costa has a huge experience on collaborating the other way around from what, what is usually uh, called technology pool. So, uh, but I'll hand it to you to, to present uh, your, 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 to do your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge Figueira. Uh, uh, and thank you uh, for this uh, opportunity. Actually, uh, I should um, clarify uh, one point that I am not really a co-finder uh, and it would be much better that uh, uh, WSPP would here be represented by Manuel Gramero, our colleague, uh, who is now in North Cyprus, because he really was uh, the co-founder uh, and uh, I just was uh, invited to uh, join the, the project uh, some, some year later. And uh, I have uh, done some, uh, some work uh, in cooperation, but of course Manuel knows it uh, from the beginning. Well, WSVP uh, means we solve building problems. Uh, that's the name that was given to, the, to, the, to this uh, uh, company. And uh, the main goal, the, the mission that, has, that was uh, Settle, uh, or set up uh, for uh, WSPV was uh, by using the state of the art of scientific knowledge uh, to balance both uh, indoor environment uh, quality uh, and uh, building costs uh, either in uh, cost, uh, terms of energy consumption and also of maintenance and operation and also uh, taking into account environmental impacts. Uh, WSPP was founded in uh, 2009, and um, uh, it was founded as a spin-off from the mechanical engineering department, and to give, um, uh, to uh, uh, give rise to, the, to, to a cooperation that was uh, being already done between uh, the University of Coimbra and some technical uh, uh, support for development of um, uh, solutions to monitor and study environmental, uh, indoor environmental quality, either in indoor air quality and uh, other uh, uh, branches of uh, like, like uh, noise and so on. So um, by that time, uh, 
the first version of Janus, which is a, a real-time web-based monitoring and an analysis platform, was launched. Uh, and uh, by that time also, some uh, partnership was established with a big uh, Portuguese building company, which is a uh, Teixeira Duarte, and uh, the first commercial Janus uh, monitoring network was established in the headquarters of this company in Lisbon, uh, involving uh, about 50 energy meters, uh, 15 indoor air quality uh, uh, monitoring stations, allowing to monitor um, CO2, air temperature, relative humidity, and also with a, a weather station. Um, some other uh, reference projects that uh, uh, were important uh, within the, the history of the, of the company uh, were the um, seven uh, retrofitted schools by uh, Park Escolar that uh, are uh, nowadays being monitored uh, uh, with uh, this system, and also the airport uh, Faro, uh, which uh, started with uh, with uh, just one part, and uh, gradually has been the, this network, which is based in in a wireless network of, of sensors, uh, has been it has it is very uh, simply uh, amplified and has been. Uh, amplified along the years. And uh, by uh, 2011, uh, there was a big project in, in Brazil, in the World Trade Center of Sao Paulo, uh, which uh, involved the um, integrated um, evaluation uh, of indoor environmental in, uh, conditions. Uh, there, are, there were some of these five uh, big buildings had real problems in, in regarding mainly uh, thermal comfort and huge problems of uh, energy consumption. So um, this was also a, a big project. And um, in 2012, uh, the company became uh, a member of the group Ideal Tower. And uh, uh, some uh, projects involving uh, building automation uh, started and is also nowadays a branch of the company. And last year, uh, we started a research and development project, uh, which is called the Smart Window. Uh, it will be a, a window, um, a sensor-based uh, system that will allow hybrid ventilation. So uh, either natural or forced ventilation or both simultaneously, uh, balanced according to the balance between indoor uh, requirements and also uh, outdoor, so uh, outdoor environmental conditions. And uh, last year, the third version of Janus also uh, was uh, launched, and um, some uh, different types of buildings have been uh, monitored uh, with this system, uh, like hospitals, hotels, and, and uh, other facilities. Uh, here we have um, a, a summary of the activities, uh, solutions, and services of, of the company. And, uh, well, uh, we keep involved in the, uh, cooperating with the university, not only in, in these projects and research, uh, other research activities, but also in giving support for training uh, students uh, in last year, either master degree uh, students, to uh, let them be involved in real situations regarding uh, the energy efficiency and indoor uh, quality of buildings. Um, and uh, every year we have uh, half a dozen of, of, of students working with us, and also some uh, in the scope of their PhD students, because all, uh, some of these cases that have been uh, and are nowadays being monitored are good uh, case studies for several uh, uh, s studies uh, in graduation, um, and uh, we uh, continue to have uh, uh, this uh, close uh, cooperation with the university. Uh, so that's what I have thought for, for the moment. Okay, thank you, Jose Costa, for, for your presentation. And um, yesterday, uh, well, I, I will hand to Joseph Shannon now uh, his presentation. Let's give a, an applause to Jose Costa.
And I'll hand it to Joseph Shaman. Yesterday, well, after the game, I was feeling depressed. So I just <laughs> get to the Google and, and prepare the presentation. I, I was uh, Googling um, um, uh, Joseph Shaman's name to, to find a little bit about him. I didn't know him before, so uh, to, to prepare the meeting. And I, it's impressive. Uh, it's a serial entrepreneur. And I'll handle it to, 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 to just to do your presentation about the, the theme of the, the, the conference, the, 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 the collaboration between the industry and, and the university towards entrepreneurship, but also to explain us a little bit better, what, what is a, um, a business design capital? Uh, I found something I, about Jan Yemenet. Sure, <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, I think I might bring a bit of a different perspective to this, so I will right off try to address your question, okay. but first preface it quickly because I'll probably forget uh, to address it if I don't right away. So first of all, I, I love reality, and I think that everybody that's seating in front of me should love reality. And what does that mean? So what it means is this, that you must call out every day what's good and what's bad. First, you need to do that within yourself. So assess yourself first. Call out what's good and bad, honestly. Because isn't it a lot better to eat your own arm than to have someone eat it for you? I think it is. So be critical of yourself first. Don't accept uh, what you think is excellence. Uh, strive for something better because we can all do better. I, I, I get driven that way all, every day. So I think that that's the first thing. And the second thing is obviously to focus on the individual, which I'll come back to after my answer of, uh, of, of your question. So uh, capital comes in, uh, I believe, three forms. Um, one, of course, is the capital that everyone tries to hunt, which is money. M money is not the first kind of capital that you should hunt. The first kind of capital you should hunt was obviously enunciated by Professor Cooney in that you should hunt knowledge and in the hunt, you acquire it. When you use it and practice upon it, it becomes more than knowledge, right? It becomes skill. It becomes a meaningful tool. It can, in some respects, be more than a tool. It can be uh, the reason de existence. It can be something within itself. So understand that that's important. So the next piece of capital that is uh, very important is relational capital. It's relationships. You have relationships all over. You have relationships with your family, friends, etc you need to seek out business relationships. Um, relationships that will help you to move things that you know in one sense of your knowledge, know-how capital, i.e. intellectual property or things you've created, and you need to connect that with relationships that help you drive that in the real world by defining a need or by uh, seeing pain. Um, very few things are supply-based. Uh, what do I mean by that? The demand gets driven in, in different ways. So uh, let's take, for example, 99.9% .9 of what you're going to face is demand-based. You're solving a need of pain. Um, and Professor Cooney addressed that in one of his slides. However, there's a, a, a small one-tenth of 1%, one I believe, that's supply-based, i.e. something so great that everyone has to have it, that this would be maybe an iPhone. It drove a whole era of smartphones that we use today. It's entirely different than anything we'd ever seen before. And we didn't say we need this, right? Did anyone say they needed this? And Steve Jobs said, hey, I'm going to design it for you. Steve Jobs told you that you needed this. And you love it. So don't necessarily think that you always have to respond to pain. 99.9% .9 of the time you're going to respond to pain. But give yourself that flexibility to say, wow, can I really come up with something really, really big? And that, you know what that does? That focuses you to respond to demand. Because it's incredibly hard to do the supply-based product. It's virtually impossible. That will refocus you. So I use that as a focus tool. Uh, so, and I, that was three forms of capital, right? And we started with the least important. So what I do is I focus on integrating and designing all the pieces of that capital and mixing them up. I take what is typically first and make it last. So does that, does that answer your yeah, question? Or please, is that, okay? Okay. So, um, at least I answered one question, <laughs> hopefully correctly. Um, <laughs> the next part is focusing on the individual. So uh, I was recently in the islands in Aruba, and, and when I was there on business uh, throughout the islands in the Caribbean, I, I had occasion to dovetail it with a wedding. And uh, the priest was a Catholic priest, uh, Filipino uh, origin, and he uh, was the vicar of three islands. And he was so instructive in his uh, marriage ceremony that he started by talking about the multiple pieces of a good marriage. And do you know the first one that he started with? It was fascinating to me. 
He started with the first thing that we started with today. Knowledge. What does that mean? It means <laughs> you need to acquire it, as much of it as you can because we only do come, we come preloaded with all our various uh, vagaries and, uh, uh, and limitations. And the limitation is that we haven't de-risked ourselves enough to broaden and deepen our understanding and knowledge so that we don't have as many questions to ask. We can self-answer them. Isn't that nice that you don't have to ask? I mean, we have Google today, right? But wouldn't it be nice if you didn't have to talk into it or type into it? You kind of knew the answer already. And so that's incredibly difficult to do. So none of what we're talking about here is easy. Uh, if, if you think that it is, then you should just leave and go take a nap. And you'll be really, you'll have a nice, quiet, relaxing day, but you won't live a meaningful life. So you have to make the decision as to whether you want to have a purposeful, meaningful life or whether you don't. And there's so many different iterations of that that you shouldn't just say that there's one formula for that because you're going to create your own formula, right? When you go to a restaurant, think of the chef as helping to create the formulas that he thinks you're going to like. But when you cook at home, you have the right to create your own formula, right? So this is the same space as that. You're at home cooking. Don't be afraid to uh, go into the kitchen and try some new formulas. A lot of the stuff you make, you might not like. It might taste pretty lousy, right? And so you're going to say, wow, I'm never going to use those combinations again. That's the whole failure thing, right? Don't be afraid to fail because when you fail cooking at home, you eventually find a dish that you make that you really love. And guess what that's called? That's called success. And so you've succeeded in that. Isn't that wonderful? So this is part of life. We don't know black without white. We do not know success and can never know success without failure. And so part of our sovereigns are, are there to, to protect us, right? The government of Portugal is there to protect you. The government of the United States is there to protect me. Who protects me from myself? Who protects you from yourself? You have, to, you have to hit yourself harder than anyone would externally to protect yourself. Because then anything that comes at you, you're going to be able to deal with, right? It's like training for a fight, training for any physical activity. So the Greeks had it right. It's this whole athleticism of, of course, the body. But it's athleticism of the mind. And we don't really focus enough on that. I think that we need to give our minds just as much activity as we do our physical body, and obviously both, and integrate that. Because if you travel a lot, you have to be able to travel, right? And if you're doing business, you have to be able to eat, right? Travel, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to go through the regime of just daily life activities. But they're all connected. Everything that we do is connected. So, so try, to, try to be mindful of the life that you're living. And in so doing, that's going to open up opportunities to you probably that you didn't know exist because you're building yourself out to uh, accept and be open to some of the opportunities that come your way. They're not always going to be obvious, but it, many times they'll present themselves. And because you're added knowledge to your life, you're going to be able to recognize those. Recognition is the most important part of things. Recognizing and culling through everything that comes in your life. Which do I do? Which do I don't do? That's incredibly difficult. I struggle with it every day. Gonzalo struggles with it every day. I'm sure, Professor Cooney, we all struggle with it every day. And so get comfortable with that. If you're comfortable with that process, because that's a lifelong process, it, you must get comfortable with it to have a, a meaningful life and a shot at success. You have to deliver this, you have to figure out this culling process, taking the good and keeping it and get rid of, uh, get rid of the bad. So be, uh, embrace it, don't, don't, don't fight it. Um, I don't know if I've taken up most of my time, <laughs> which I probably have. And I don't think, um, uh, uh, lastly, uh, when you focus on the individual, uh, when you focus on yourself, you're limiting the risk that you will fail as an individual at whatever you happen to do, the whole de-risking process. So embrace it, have fun with it, and be, don't be careful. Make some mistakes, and you're going to get to success a lot faster that way. Okay, thank you, Joseph. And uh, I was reminding me of uh, 
uh, I went recently to Colombia to, in Medellin to help them to create tech transfer offices there and I met a priest and I was reminded, you spoke about <laughs> a priest, and I was speaking with the priest about tech, uh, knowledge transfer and he, he said to me the, the most interesting definition of tech transfer and knowledge transfer, he said it's, it's an easy job, you just have to get together a person that knows with a, a person that understands. <laughs> so, very interesting. Recognition. Yes, yeah. it is. <laughs> and well, with all the respect for my Portuguese uh, colleagues in the panel uh, um, uh, and Professor Cuny, I, I would like to present, I don't know if you know already uh, Professor Teresa Mendes uh, before, but she's kind of our Vasco da Gama of the <laughs> collaboration of industry with, 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 uh, with comp and creating companies and uh, spin-offs. Uh, Teresa Mendes runs our business incubator, IPN, and I'll hand her to her to speak a little bit about uh, her experience and to speak also how we are, how hard it is to us to, to and how good are, are we dealing with the, uh, constructing the uh, innovation ecosystem around the, the, the region of Coimbra. Okay, so I'll, I'll try to be brief and, and try to describe some of our activities at the Instituto Pedro Nunes. Uh, by the way, uh, for those who don't know, uh, Pedro Nunes was um, Portuguese mathematician at the University of, of Coimbra and invented and, dev and developed the Nonio that was an important technology for our navigation system in the 16th uh, century. So this is just make the bridge with our keynote <laughs> <Yes>. speaker. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, so it's uh, our business is innovation and so it's a very huge responsibility to have this name, Pedro Nunes, the, the name of our institute. Uh, the, uh, the institute was created about 23 years ago by the University of Coimbra and its goal is to bridge the gap between the research at the university and uh, the market. Uh, we have um, our own technological labs and we do applied research, so we, we manage uh, the, the demand and the, the sort of identifying problems uh, close to the enterprises and try to solve the problems uh, with applied research in very strong connection with the research centers at the university. And then we have our, uh, the business incubator uh, where we stimulate the creation of new enterprises um, and we help them for the first uh, four years of life. So they, they can stay in our facilities for uh, at most four years. Um, for the creation of um, these new enterprises, we have a very strong uh, connection again with the university and uh, we, we are part of the university ecosystem. So we have been running several ignition grants in the past um, four or five years. And also the innovation programs uh, with some funds for um, proof of, of concepts. Uh, and then finally, we, we, we received the, the new enterprise and we uh, try to, uh, to help them in, the, in the, the, the first steps. Uh, of course, it's very important. Um, networking is very important. Uh, so we have a very, very strong um, uh, uh, we belong to a very different networks at the national international levels, and we start by putting together students, researchers, investors, uh, companies, public entities, uh, so to, to make possible uh, projects that um, help to, to the, the emergence of the new uh, enterprises. Uh, we have. Um, uh, we have a very a strong presence in uh, national clusters and uh, networks of uh, sectorial, most of them sectorial clusters, and also international ones. Uh, I'd like to start to, we have most of the, the networks we belong are European, but we also, um, uh, we, we have been gradually um, in, increasing the, the cooperation with other countries outside Europe. And I'd like to, to mention the University of Texas uh, at Austin program, where we have a very close um, 
relation and interchange of enterprises, and of course the MIT Portugal program, where um, we, we have been sending every year uh, several teams of uh, entrepreneurs uh, to participate in the building global innovators. Uh, it's very important for us because it helps uh, our very small teams of uh, entrepreneurs to, uh, to be exposed to different um, uh, environments and uh, it has been quite helpful. I, I don't have the, the figures uh, by heart, but several uh, teams have been presenting every year. So uh, it's, it has been a very, very nice experience. And I think I would uh, stop for that. Thank you, Professor Treza. Well, it, it was a, uh, a very interesting uh, first int uh, inter introduction for each, each one of the, of the panelists, but we only have 15 minutes till the session ends, so it's a kind of dramatic uh, to, to manage the time in this session, but I will just suggest that I'll make a, a general an uh, question for uh, each one of you wants to feels like to, to, to answer, uh, uh, to, uh, of course, including Professor Charles Cooney, of course, and, and then one or two answers from the audience that would like to, to, to ask to any of our panelists. So I was uh, analyzing and reflecting about uh, thinking about uh, Professor Charles' presentation, and he, he spoke a lot of issues that uh, we must have to have a, a good, a successful collaboration uh, with industry. Uh, he spoke. Uh, I don't have all the topics here, but about education in entrepreneuring in curricula. I think in Portugal we are doing a good effort on that on that uh, trend. Uh, in, in, the, in general, in several universities, I know that there are several initiatives that are going on to include uh, using the Bologna process that were education in entrepreneuring is included in the in the in the curricula. Uh, students led competition. We have a case here from, of Diana, but there are several cases here. In Coimbra, I know that we, we support directly from our liaison office around roughly 60 initiatives each year. From those 60 initiatives, five to 10, they are organized by us. The others are organized generally by students or by uh, the community, the, the academia. So I, I think we are very active, not only in Coimbra, but in, generally, as I, I know, in universities in, in, in Portugal. Um, Action learning, we have, we have I teams from, of course, from, it's an example of action learning in here that uh, Juan Nuno just uh, mentioned. Uh, uh, and we have others, I mean, Kotec has done a good job, a uh, very good job on that too. And uh, there, there are several initiatives in, around the, the universities in, in Portugal, as far as I know. Innovation ecosystem, as I mentioned, we have here. Minho has developed an ecosystem. Lisbon is developing his uh, ecosystem. Uh, Biocant is uh, also part of our ecosystem here. So I, I think we are. Are, uh, getting into it, we, and we are uh, doing. I think the, 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 the correct steps. The next step we are doing. It's uh, we are going through the roadmap on that too. Uh, collaborative activities. I think we have to increase that uh, more uh, to emphasize that issue here in Portugal. Investment necessary. Also, uh, we have a prob uh, problem of investment. Not only private investment into projects but also investment into consolidating the resources, the infrastructures, but mainly human resources to, to uh, boost uh, the, 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 the things that are already in place there. So uh, my question to anyone of, of you that wishes to, 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 uh, to, to answer is, how come the, the MIT uh, Portugal project could uh, help us uh, 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 to, to consolidate our experiences here in Portugal uh, uh, towards uh, collaboration, uh, third uh, universitary mission, uh, and uh, towards a more entrepreneurial um, society. I have uh, here some topics that I was just uh, uh, writing down. Uh, uh, I think one, one key aspect that I found in, in MIT and, 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 and in the campus that I don't find here is what Richard Florida told us about tolerance. This tolerance of the society towards a, a more the, the entrepreneurial uh, uh, persons and the innovative persons. Uh, I think uh, we also 
of course, it, it goes a little bit uh, not inside the, the, the core of the program, MIT program, but I think we have to invest also on primary and secondary school towards the entrepreneurial curricula, not only in the uh, 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 education. And we don't have that in Portugal. I think it's very necessary to um, consolidate human resources that work in this, this uh, issue, to, um, to uh, invest more in inter internationalization. Uh, IPN is doing that. Uh, and others, but I uh, know that we are almost, we are, cre we created our accelerator that uh, aims to support that process of internationalization. I think that one problem also in Portugal is related with, um, we have many spin-off companies on services, but we don't have as much in trans transactional transactionable goods, so products that could be uh, easily uh, internationalized. And I think we, we, we and I'm, I'm IT problem could uh, give uh, an help on that. Um, also, uh, to support, I, I think I find very important to, the, for the regional, regional companies for the first step of Valor, uh, doing the valorization of uh, technology. To, 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 uh, I mean, the university have, uh, of course, IP and uh, uh, IP assets. Um, we have to get into the market. And I find that uh, regional companies and regional partners in the ecosystem are critical for doing those first steps, uh, doing the uh, proof of concept, doing the first and second stage clinical trials, for instance, that help us further or later to, to get into the global market too. And of course, as uh, Joseph just said, uh, we, we need a creativity gym or something, something for the mind, not, not only home space, but something that, that we have uh, a creativity gym where we can muscle our um, brains. So this is my topics um, that I think MIT Portugal program could help us further to develop our collaboration between universities and industry, but i leave an open question for any one of you that wishes to understand. Um, how come MIT Portugal program could help us to further develop our efforts on university industry collaboration and towards inter more entrepreneurial society? Which one wants to answer? Yes, Lena, of course. Um. One of the, the first issues is always back to people. Uh, when I look from the examples from US and MIT, it was about building this huge network for a long period of time and nurturing relationships with uh, industry uh, and also being able uh, actually to keep and nurture these uh, kind of relationships that in, in somehow in Portugal we just start doing that, I don't know, 10 years from now, so this kind of whole capital that in the other side of the Atlantic they have, they had built from years, uh, from years. So it's kind of, I think what we can learn is that we have to go outside and to learn with each other and also to build, it's not just by doing, well, for instance, a conference each year, it's to keep the, a whole conversation for a long period of time between academia and industry. And secondly, I will back to, to students. Um, also, the students right now, they are taking ownership of their own future. So it's not just the E3, but we are seeing a lot of groups trying to make questions and trying to organize themselves. And um, it, it's quite nice how right now we're able uh, to get to different people and how flexible we have to be. That's an, another issue that I have. If you look, it's very... Um, stiff uh, structures probably are not going to get nowhere and so we also have to learn uh, how to learn to be flexible so we can actually be faster um, move faster and also to get things done because most of the times what I feel about is kind of we do a lot of programs and when we got to execution everything falls down so it's kind of it's kind of these two main ideas that I have to live. Thank you Diana. Anyone Yes, Joseph. I'll make a point uh, quickly about um, your sort of uh, migration from services to products. I think there's companies within Portugal, and I, one of the names escapes me, but it's a small refrigerator company. And they manufacture a specific sized refrigerator to fit a specific size religious or ethnic group's needs vis-a-vis -vis cold storage of their meats. Mm -hmm. 
So, and you might know the company. No, 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 no. Uh, I, I forget the name. Yeah, me too. But it's that, it's that, as an example, I use that because um, reaching out to the rest of the world, is, as uh, was just mentioned, is critical. You look for needs everywhere and you adapt to those needs, your, your product that you may already make. You make it a little differently and you, you service a niche. Um, because uh, in manufacturing, at least in, in the, the world of margins, uh, everything is very, very thin, as you probably can understand and know. So you really have to niche it out. Find a niche, find a need that's not served, and, and drive that. That's, the, that's almost 100% of what you're going to be doing. Uh, you're not going to make a better refrigerator so good that some, someone else has to always have it. You're going to be responding to a need. So with that, I think you can build out a niche-based hardware manufacturing economy. But, but we have few cases of that. That's a problem. I think we have. We'll build, build, yeah, build on sure, those few. We sure. have to build. Okay. Anyone more wishes to? Maybe just a few comments. Just building on that, uh, uh, Joe, Joe's, uh, Shaman's comment. Um, one, one thing that we did for for the Portuguese government a couple of years ago was, why isn't there more entrepreneurs? What, what, what's missing? Obviously, there was lots of things missing, and I won't have time to cover them today. But <laughs> one very important one is. Um, role models. So we need examples. So the Portuguese students and uh, professors and the old community members need good positive examples that reinforce the experimentation part and don't uh, 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 penalize entrepreneurs for trying. So that's, that's a cultural aspect that I think we, we still have. Uh, uh, I think we all believe that uh, we, there's still lots of work to be done. So we need to encourage and prepare for failure. I think it's very much preparing you know, to, to do an experiment, m knowing that the odds are against us, but still the process is the most important aspect, uh, the learning process. So we'll, we'll need to prepare to, to conduct 10, 20, 30, 50, 100. And, and uh, as we do it, others will, will, will learn with us and uh, eventually we'll, we'll succeed. So those role models are very important. Second component, education. And uh, George, you, you mentioned that beautifully. So the parents, the, the, the professors, they need to allow their children, you know, right from uh, day one, to uh, uh, be able to learn by experimentation, by trial and, 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 and error, and obviously uh, uh, learning through that process. But they, they, in, uh, Charlie mentioned an aspect which is very inter interesting, entrepreneuring mm -hmm. rather than entrepreneurship. So it's the action that goes with trying and, and obviously spotting a challenge and obviously overcoming, uh, trying to overcome that challenge. So we must not penalize. That's something we should start doing every day when we manage people, every day when we talk to people. And the change we can do that with that attitude is, is enormous. So that's my little contribution to. Yeah, another problem that I find I, when I was in, in uh, Boston, um, in, 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 uh, in, in uh, the college, uh, uh, um, there, were, there, there was a discipline about entrepreneurial uh, 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 fundamentals that was mandatory for all the students in the first year uh, uh, in Babson College, I mean. I mean um, it was mandatory for, for all the students to have, and where in the first semester, semester they, all of them had to do a work uh, uh, to, to, to draw, draw, draft a, a pitch of a, a business idea, then to do a prototyping, and then to, to negotiate with the professors some investment for starting the company. And in the second semester, they, they start the company with, with inve uh, money from, from the university. Babson College uh, until uh, up to three thousand dollars, I guess. Uh, I'm doing bad by the head. And then during the second semester, they have to break even, and then to at the end of the semester, they do a very nice uh, presentation of the results. They close the companies, and they return to the, the professor the three thousand dollars if uh, if possible, and all the rest is given for charity. Um, and, and I asked the, the, the professors, but well, why this is mandatory? Because one cannot teach entrepreneurship without feeling through the process. One cannot climb uh, the mountain in, in Google. We have to go there and see how, how, we, how it is done. So it's important to go through the process. Uh, and uh, what was impressive for, for me is, uh, but every one of the companies were closed at the end of the semester. Yes, everyone. But there wasn't a 
one entrepreneur that feels, well, I want to go on. This year. I'm getting some money from here. I want to, uh, I, I will forget Babson College. I will do the, the, the project. I says, no, every one of them closed this, the company. And, and then they told me that, uh, said, yes, you're, you Portuguese, they have, you have difficulties on selling a company. You, you, are, you are too much attached to the companies when they create it, and you don't sell them. There's a point where you have to go to IP or something and sell the company, and if you are a serial entrepreneur, then you go to another project. And it's true. There are, there are very good successful companies in Portugal that grow up and are very good, but uh, the CEOs and the founders are very much attached to, to them and it's difficult to, to sell and go to, uh, to, to, to do the cycle of a serial entrepreneuring. Um, so I think that's also, it's not the major in, uh, problem here in Portugal, but it's also important. So before I go into the public to do some final uh, questions, I want to get back to, to, to Professor Charles. So how, how do you feel in your, as, uh, as much as you know from the Portuguese reality compared to the MIT, how can we, uh, MIT progr uh, program, Portuguese program, could help us further develop these this, uh, activities in Portugal with your help? It's a very big question that you ask. Um, <laughs> you know, how can we help? I, 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 I believe that we, the uh, MIT, with our uh, colleagues in the other universities that are part of MPP, uh, have done a, a really terrific job, as all of you have spoken to, of doing experiments, initiating new activities, uh, engaging students, engaging faculty, uh, uh, celebrating student initiative, uh, celebrating uh, su venture success. And my, my, my belief is that we, we should continue to go down that path and uh, where we can be helpful is to encourage you to do what you're doing very well um, and to do it more broadly. You know, it's, uh, as several of you have on the panel have spoken, it's about people. Um, people are the ones who uh, develop knowledge and who translate that knowledge into impact. It's about uh, experiential learning. Uh, experiential learning is about people doing things, uh, taking ideas, building prototypes, going to a customer, learning how to revamp the prototype, do it again, learning the iteration that is essential to the entrepreneurial process. Uh, and I think the, the more that we can collectively uh, look at how to bring these lessons into the universities and how to the universities can collaborate amongst themselves, which I think has been a marvelous, um, it, it, it's been a challenge. Uh, you know, universities, we, we teach collaboration and cooperation and partnership and don't operate in silos, but universities are their own worst enemy, <laughs> um, MIT included, in how we operate in silos, disciplinary silos. The excitement, uh, the challenges, are at, in, at the interfaces. So I, I think what we need to do is to teach our students to give them the confidence to go to interfaces, to places they haven't been to before, um, to confidence, uh, to be able to go where it's uncomfortable, uh, and to be able to navigate that, no pun, pun intended. Uh, and and, and that's, that, that's, how we, that's how we make progress. Uh, to celebrate the success, n not to penalize failure. Um, there's nothing, an, an expert is someone who has made more mistakes at doing something than anybody else. <laughs> A successful expert recognizes that they're mistakes and only makes them once. So to me, it's what, we, what can we do? We, we focus on our students. Uh, we focus on the education that will take them to a new place, that gives them confidence, that celebrates that success, uh, and uh, continue down this journey and in this, in this path. Thank you very much. And, and I'll, now I'll leave you two, three questions uh, to the public. We are uh, closing the session, but I think it's important to have some questions from the audience. So is anyone that wants to, that's a, or there's a one person there that wants to ask a question. So we will we'll get two or three 
questions and then we answer them. Okay. It's working. So it was very delightful to see this panel, but it seems that we are focused on the success of the companies and people are not speaking about why ideas or how why startups fail. So I just want to know the top three reasons why an idea or a startup fails. Okay, thank you. One or two more questions. Is there any? Yeah, one person upstairs. Um, okay, so it, it was very interesting to see this quite similar ideas, um, but I would like to, to, to ask, so we have the MIT Portugal program that is running from the past eight, nine, ten years. Um, and we have here several uh, companies, we have several universities that are represented, but I would like to know um, why don't we have more cooperation between them? Um, why don't we have students, for example, working in projects that are uh, coming from different, uh, different universities, um, bringing as well uh, more companies to support these projects, to integrate these students, uh, in order to later, when they finish the, their project, they can be included, for example, these projects that can keep going inside these uh, companies. Um, but most important, I think, that is the, the, the support that these companies could give in terms of knowledge, in terms of funding, uh, and in terms of their own network that could help the students solving the, the problems that they have on their own projects. Thank you. Okay. No more questions, so I'll leave this, this to for the, any one of the panelists want to, to, to answer the, the, why companies fail? <laughs> Start up. Why do companies fail? Uh, that, of course, is the, uh, we, we, we're all trying to answer that question, and when I can figure it out, I'll retire. Oh, I am retiring. You got to In my experience, the, the most, probably the most common method of failure is an in, inadequate connectivity between the product or service being produced uh, and the customer. Um, customers buy things they want. They don't buy things they, we perceive they want, with the exception, <laughs> of, the, with the exception of the smartphone. Uh, and many companies fail um, in very early because there's a, uh, uh, in, an inadequate understanding of the market. Uh, a, a, second, uh, a, a second common reason um, is that there's an inadequate understanding of competition. And competition is not necessarily coming um, uh, at you head on uh, in the same domain that you're working. Often it's by competitive services uh, or uh, alternative ways of doing things. Uh, it's often called disruption. Uh, and if you, if you don't understand the world uh, in a, you know, very broadly in terms of uh, competition, and that's another major reason for failure. Uh, there are lots of other operational regions, uh, poor, poor management, uh, uh, inadequate resources, uh, and the like. But often, in my experience, those issues are linked to the first two. Uh, and that is, you don't understand your customer and you don't understand the competition. No, I did one. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 the second question is a very interesting question, and I'm very curious to hear what your answer is. <laughs> Maybe I'll throw a few ideas also, building on what Charlie has mentioned, because we, our job is to work with companies and try to build businesses. And uh, obviously, before companies, we have teams, we have people. We have people, people with a passion, people with a goal, people with an idea. Uh, sometimes their idea does not reflect uh, the reality. Uh, sometimes we all think we have the answer and we know 
uh, we have a great uh, uh, way, or we think we have ahead of us, and we start talking to customers and things don't uh, quite match up. So when does, but this question is very interesting because what is failure? When can we say a company has failed? So the basic definition is when we run out, run out of funds and uh, you can pay salaries, maybe, or let's go back a bit, you, have, you, have, you are bootstrapping, you have no salaries, but then after two years, three years, four years, five years, you haven't built anything. So maybe that's not still a failure. Maybe you're still learning about the product, about the market, about... So the question about failure is that there's no real answer. So if you... Uh, set yourself 12 months interval, which, which I've done before in my previous startups, and I said, I'll spend, my budget is 50K in a year, and after that, if I can't execute uh, what I think I should be doing, then uh, that will be a failure for me, and I'll look for a job. And that's what I had to do, for example, uh, two times before. Um, and, and by the way, my, my first uh, venture, for example, was uh, selling loudspeakers. I was uh, assembling and I was, uh, wanted to become a sound engineer. So it just providing you some examples on, and the failure was I couldn't scale up business. So it was one employee, then two employees, then uh, three part-time employees, then we wanted uh, talent and we couldn't get it. So I, I went to the UK to learn how to uh, become an acoustic engineer and I became a mechanical engineer. I went to work to Hewlett Packard instead and before that nuclear physics. So <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that uh, you have to execute and, and de define your own failure. So we see different uh, things on, 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 on working with startups that we've been working. Uh, Charlie's answered the first most obvious straightforward ones. There's no need, there's no market. We think we had a product, guess what? We have no differentiation. We have nothing, we have to go back, drawing board, uh, uh, look for more research funds, go back to research and, and, and uh, do some more homework, and then we'll be back. So that's, that's in my respect, not a failure. We have one company uh, uh, at the moment, uh, which uh, the, 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 in fact uh, uh, was founded by, by a, a, an entrepreneur that's now doing a PhD in the MIT Portugal problem because he realized that he needed more technology to solve the problem in energy harvesting that he's trying to solve. So he's now going back to drawing board learning more about the process, uh, the sorry, the science, and, and uh, he knows about the process because he's talked with thousands of customers. He knows what they need, he knows what uh, the competition is doing after three or four years of process. And now it's doing a PhD to actually uh, realize his dream. So more important is that uh, I think w w what is the, the reason why he, you failed is what is failure. And uh, eventually um, I think that most companies, if the team's there, if they're really, really willing to do it, if you're willing to go back to drawing board and do the research, do the homework, find the team members, find the funding, etc., and also uh, risk, accept risk, there's no failure, really. It's, it's, it's just the speed of the process and execution. Okay, thank you, Gonzalo. Yeah, Gonzalo, for you. Okay, Joseph. Yeah. Just, I think we have to distinguish between failure of what? failure of the idea or failure of the individual. And many times people personalize these things, at least society does. You should not, and you should educate uh, those that you think do, that this idea did not work. It doesn't mean that I'm a failure. Personally, it means that my idea did not work, and guess what, I'm on to the next one. What you can do to de-risk that problem is, uh, I see more things that come across uh, our desks, and they're something that's just a small change of something that exists. So do a competitive comparative analysis first, right? Compare what exists with what you're trying to do. Then do a competitive analysis on uh, whether they're making money or not or whether that's commercialized or not. If you do those two things in conjunction, you're going to start weeding out the things that aren't going to work. And you'll be able to de-risk your existence moving forward to get to something that's truly going to work and be a success. 
Okay, thank you, Joseph. One last question before we break the, the panel for, for, for the next uh, 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 point on the agenda. One, one part of all in, in what we feel in Portugal, it's very difficult for a faculty member to, to go and create uh, spin-offs. I think João Moreira knows that <laughs> very well. So it's difficult. So there's a question of exclusivity. There's a question of uh, also uh, have um, um, uh, 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 a frame that enables the, the person to, to try if, uh, to, to, to manage the risk, as you, you said before in your presentation. So how did you, how do you promote that in, in, in MIT and uh, how can we learn with that experience? I, I just get to know an experience from the Spanish government. It was very interesting, a pilot uh, initiative where the government, if, if there is a faculty that wants to s create a spin-off company, he has up to a one year of uh, where he doesn't have to have, give, teach uh, any lessons, and the Spanish government covers the costs for the university to, to have a substitute pr professor for, for during that year. And it, they did that, that pilot with uh, 40 faculty members. I, I think it went very well. I don't know if you have this kind of experience also in, in MIT, and, how can we promote that here? Uh, the, the question of uh, uh, academic entrepreneurship often emerges. Um, the most important transfer of technology, or the technology transfer agent, uh, is our students and postdocs. Uh, faculty very rarely leave the institute uh, to form a company. Uh, faculty may do part of their sabbatical or take a leave of absence um, under, under the usual terms and conditions. There's no external funding to, to support that. Uh, not that I'm aware of. Um, and uh, faculty will often take part of their consulting time um, the one day a week that they're allowed to, to uh, devote to outside professional activities and use it to be an advisor to uh, the company. Uh, while an active faculty member, we are not permitted to uh, take an operating role uh, uh, as an officer uh, in, a, in a company. So t typically at MIT, I would say, uh, first and foremost, um, te technology-based entrepreneurship, which is what we're talking about, is socially acceptable uh, at the institution. Uh, and that is, has not always been the case, but it certainly has been for a number of decades. Second, um, there are very clear rules of engagement that, that we, we can uh, uh, proceed down to be involved in a technology startup. And third, by far the most critical element to success uh, in a technology-based startups are the students and the postdocs uh, who are the ones that take the risk of joining a company uh, once they have left the institution. And we also draw very strong lines between uh, what you're able to do outside of MIT and what you're allowed to do inside of MIT, and they cannot, they cannot cross over. So the, th those, are the, those are the simple uh, observations that I would, would, would make. Okay, Professor Charles, thank you very much for your uh, input, your insight. So I will just uh, we will close the panel. I would like to thank you all for uh, being here at uh, the panel with us and us also, of course, we, uh, I will thank you to, you to be uh, there on the audience to, to listen to us. So I will, uh, we will break now for the poster session of the students. I will, I will ask you for an applause for our panelists, please. Thank you.